was struck by Paulo's discussion of vocation and the notion that teaching is a vocation because I think that this has been very strong in Canada as well as in Brazil and I think um, there's a strong strain of that in the critical literacy <coughs> movement as well of course as in the Frarian tradition and so um, the um, Balancing profession against vocation is a real challenge because profession can certainly mean you get a certain kind of respect in society, but it can also be converted into the neoliberal kind of ideology that Ian uh, was talking about, where you know you're simply working for a salary and you have no larger sense of the social and civic value of what you do. So there's a real tension, I think, between that notion of vocation and the notion of profession that you drew our attention to and it's in the paper. It seemed to me as well that both Ian and Paulo responded to Valkyria's stress on agency by saying agency needs to be modified by reflection, by critique, Ian said by agenda, Paulo said, um, by understanding that history and recognizing that there are many forms of uh, agency that can be expressed in, in ways that we might see as both positive or, or, or negative through passive resistance that can be a form of action as well as through direct action. Um, and one final comment I would make is, is simply the way Ian responded was, we need agenda, we need to add agenda. But the challenge still remains for us, what will be that agenda? And I think that, you know, Ian, you were suggesting, well, the agenda is clear, um, resist the neoliberal agenda that's already out there. But I am struck, I, I guess I would like to counter that with, you know, the, the danger of knowing in advance exactly what you want to, uh, how you want to change your students can be very coercive. It's vocation. Uh, it's vocation again. It's vocation and it can be very coercive. So the challenge I think in critique and the challenge I see in autonomy, which has its own problems, is, is what Spivak says, you know, how do you rearrange desire in a non-coercive way where <laughs> the free autonomy of the others you are working with reciprocally will lead to surprises so that you don't know <laughs> what agenda will emerge from the teaching that you do once you open people to understanding their own potential for change. And what I found most valuable in the paper was that emphasis on the fact that all people have that potential, that potential for positive change. And the, the problem that I saw in the paper that Valkyria addressed on page 11 was how can people who have not learned to practice their autonomy help others to realize their autonomy? It's, it's a challenge. So we see other people who want to speak now. Yeah. So, so Diana, just to, uh, just to pick up on, on that, uh, let me preface this by saying that language is slippery. So profession, vocation, agenda for three have at least two meanings, uh, but, but having said that, that's just as a preface. How do you teach autonomy is a problem, I think. Yes. So, so the minute you step into a classroom, uh, there are inscribed hierarchies of every kind, including the teacher-student exchange. Doesn't matter how much you think that you know about the student or the student knows about you. Teaching autonomy in itself um, well, let me put it this way, can be a contradiction, can be. I don't say it has to be, but it can be. So, how do you encourage, inscribe, teach, engage with autonomy is, is, a, is a problem that every, I think, every teacher faces, uh, regardless of your convictions, regardless of what it is that you think that you're doing in the classroom, regardless of what the students think they're doing. So, that's all I would ask. How do you teach autonomy? I think that there's an inherent contradiction in the terms. Language is slippery. Yeah, the one thing with uh, language is that it has transitive and intransitive verbs. And the, while agir seems to be intransitive, teach is transitive. And the transitivity of that verb has to, I think, be framed as uh, 
Valkyria suggests, in a Gramscian way, which means we're not dealing with individual decisions about what I'm going to do on Monday in my classroom. We are way beyond that in terms of building a, okay, a class, uh, call it professional, I would call it professional, um, network, strong network, that can model um, agency across instances of teaching sites. Um, I'm old enough to know how Canada did it with respect to English as a second language because I was there. We were unorganized, we didn't know what anyone else was doing in the rest of the country, and bit by bit, using colleagues in government, uh, colleagues in universities, bit by bit we were able to uh, enter policy conversations, we were able to enter discussions about class size, we were able to enter discussions about uh, testing issues, we were able to enter conversations even about salary and um, spoke to teachers unions to make sure that wherever issues were touching not us but our clients, our students. So we advocated through the political action committee of TESOL Canada, of which I was the first president, um, better conditions for, um, for immigrants, um, more opportunities for francophones to get uh, access to um, uh, citizenship education, and of course, from the first and foremost, um, bilingual education programs for indigenous peoples in Canada. Okay? That was agency, but it was not individual agency in the classroom. And we were in teacher education programs. There wasn't a teacher <coughs> education program in Ontario that didn't have a morning devoted to uh, how to join the profession and what the profession can do with you. And if you believe in mirror neurons, young teachers entering the profession saw older teachers exercising agency collectively, going to meetings, having conferences, and became aware, and became in a way like a real profession. And I think uh, the discussion we had yesterday about the uh, lack of status of um, teachers of English could be addressed by something along those lines. That's all. I have Lynn Mario next. Um, sure. Put your hand up a bit if you'd like to be on the list. Um, well, I've been debating it myself because I'm going to talk about similar issues in my paper this afternoon, but, uh, but there's the things which I'd like to make connections with. Um, I agree with Neil that uh, uh, when, first, I, I don't think it's an issue to say that uh, agency is something uh, we create or not. Everybody has agency. Right? We are talking about different kinds of agency, as Ian mentioned. There are different kinds of agency. Uh, and uh, for me, a, a concept of resistance is already a, a, a concept which denies agency. Because when we think of resistance, we're thinking of, of people who are almost, uh, they don't know what they're doing. They're simply reacting. Right? So it's a way of denying agency. Uh, but then we have lots of concepts of agency there. But let me take an example of what I mean. Uh, it's when we talk about, Ian, you're mentioning TESOL. I think we have different concepts of agency when uh, you speak of teaching English, for example, and we in Brazil speak of teaching English. What we mean by English are, are very different things. Maybe when a North American speaks of English or Canadian, you, speak, you, you imagine your, your language. Right? When we speak of teaching English, that's not what we imagine. It's not a language of anyone. Right? So there, there are already different forms of agency in relation to the teaching of English. Um, and then we have a concept of, uh, uh, Neil said, can we teach agency? I think. Uh, uh, if we see there are different concepts of agency and different degrees in which power limits or permits uh, agency to appear, and then I, I'll, I'll, let's say that's a connection I make with autonomy, is to what extent agency can be manifested. Uh, I don't think, and I think this is what Valkyrie was showing, was uh, maybe she didn't say it explicitly, I don't know, I didn't read your, your paper. But the connection between agency, you, you presuppose the connection between agency and the institution of schooling, which is where you, you recuperate the whole history of education in Brazil. 
And I think, uh, and you mentioned Desta, right? which is one, one of the things that he mentions is that if we assume that agency means that everyone has the capacity of thinking and reasoning and therefore everybody has agency, uh, but then uh, it doesn't mean that all our reasoning is equal. Right? And this is important when we, when we talk about the school as a social institution with a particular history, because a, a school as a social institution already has a, a pre-decided, and that's the agenda of the school, a pre-decided distribution of agencies within the institution. So to talk about autonomy uh, as it appears on the street and autonomy as permitted within the school system are two different things. Right? Uh, the school system implies policy, previous policy, it implies previous selection of who's going to be a teacher. Th these are very different issues when we compare mainstream education in Brazil with indigenous education. The whole definition of what is a teacher is totally different. Uh, the definition of a syllabus. And so when we come down to the learner, that concept of agency has been so diluted in relation to political agency in the street but that very often we, we think it's not even there, but it is there. Right? But it's a different kind of agency. Now, if we think we can bring agency from the street into the classroom, I think we're forgetting the whole ideological history of what a school is. Right? Uh, that's all I'd like to, to remember, to remind one. Um, Something Paulo said that really struck me as interesting. And there's a particular orientation or, or relationship to, to Portuguese that's very much in the kind of analytic focus on the, the grammatical aspects of language, taking it apart, putting it back together again. Which is easy, interesting in terms of, at a, at a very small scale, the production of autonomy around relationships to language, I think, is, is an interesting issue. Timothy Reagan. One of the articles we, la we read last week about language objectification mm -hmm. and he compares why that's important for teachers. And I think they're, they're really good arguments to think about. And building a personal autonomy that the teacher knows I have options here to present language to my students. If I could also uh, talk about your paper, which I found fascinating. Um, the uh, it was the Pombal reforms, right, mm -hmm. that put an end to lingua rural mm -hmm. and insisted from that time on that Portuguese be the language of Brazil. Yeah. Um, I think that the discussion of the content, my reference to agenda, is important. Because on the surface, it would seem that um, from the point of view of indigenous education, using a lingua jural, Tupi Guarani, I suppose, or Quechua in, uh, in uh, Peru, would appear to be favoring um, indigenous thought. But what's really interesting in studies of uh, Nahuatl under the um, Spanish Empire and um, Quechua after the Edict of Lima in 1581, is that what the um, Iberians did was reach into the form of those languages, take all of the indigenous content out, and keep simply the form with serious catechistic content. Okay? So the form of the language can be discussed. We can talk about English and Portuguese. We can talk about the form. But what is the content of Portuguese? What is the content of Portuguese in Brazil? What is the content of, of English in Brazil? And when you talk about the content of Portuguese in Brazil, you have to ask two things. What is Portuguese for? And even more broadly, and this is a question that Michael Byers has asked in Canada. What is Brazil for? Yeah, yeah we have about uh, five more minutes for audience discussion. So please. Yes. Uh, what have the university just talked about? It's going to uh, have this uh, double program, like uh, Portuguese and English. But it was it's um, usually private universities do. And in my state, where uh, in Alagoas, only uh, we found that is where we work. 
that have this separate pro these separate programs. The other universities, even the public ones, have a, a, a joint program. So this is common, but not not it's not a rule. So, uh, but for example, at FAO we. Uh, about, uh, I don't know how many, but 10 people graduate in English uh, less sometimes per year. I don't know, the, they, they must know it better. Uh, at other universities there, we have, they have 50 to 60 people gra graduating in English and Portuguese. So the, the quantity of, of people graduating this double graduation, double uh, courses, they, uh, it's much bigger than the number of people we grant, we uh, qualify in our uh, programs. Many more. So this is not a rule, but it happens. Uh, at USP it's different. I studied there too. So you have a choice. You can choose what language you're going to, if you want. It's okay. Uh, uh, Portuguese and English, uh, Portuguese as a, re uh, when, when Marquês Pombal came to Brazil, to change this uh, lingua gerais to uh, Portuguese, uh, he did it. He prohibited Portuguese, uh, uh, the other languages, in this, uh, in the missions, for example, where the they, it was accepted for the indigenous people to speak their languages by the Jesuits. It was. It had been uh, at that time. It had been for, for, for forbidden, and they the the. the little guys, the little indigenous guys, could not have, could not eat if they did not ask for food in Portuguese, for example. That was the rule. That was the, okay. But what happens that the documents continue, we have a difference between oral and written Portuguese. It's a big difference because of this oral tradition. In the oral tradition, we, have, we speak Portuguese in a different way. Because, I mean, we speak Portuguese in a different way from writing, for example, which is in Portuguese from Portugal, which uh, this is more connected. Writing and speaking are more connected because they speak the way, more or less, the way the, 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 doc, uh, the language, uh, more or less the same way as the language in the documents. We don't. We have a separation between the language and the documents, the language we use to write and the language we use to speak because of this oral tradition, really. What else? Ah, sorry, I'd like to, to say something about client thing. We don't have, we, have, we fight every day here, all the time, not to use this word client for students, because we don't, um, I changed my, I changed my, I changed my, 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 my university. I changed my state, because I used to work in a private university and we used to say clients, and I was, I said, I don't have clients, I have students. So I went to a public university we have, where we have students. So I prefer not to say, I don't, I don't see students as clients, but as students who are going to learn. And that's uh, what, we, what it goes with what you said. That's it. Sorry. Can I make a response to Brian? Uh, sure. Respond to Brian. Uh, now I'd like to emphasize something which Brian mentioned, uh, which is, I think is important to... Uh, uh, and, uh, um, I'm not sure to what extent this is uh, thought about, reflected on, is the difference between languages code and languages repertoire. Right? Um, because I, I think one, uh, one risk or one possibility is understanding repertoire as a plurality of code. So we have different codes that we can talk about. It's as if it opens up options and we talk about repertoires. But a repertoire is a different notion of language, which is much, much more connected to social practice than languages and abstract code is. And so therefore, uh, if, if we look at repertoires, we're, always, we're already assuming agency. Right? Uh, in, if we look at languages, abstract code, there's absolute, it's an object, no, no context, no agency involved. And I think that's an important concept of, uh, to look at languages repertoire. Not just as a plurality of a singular code, but as breaking down the whole concept of singularity and plurality. Okay, Vanderlei. Uh, yeah, I think there's uh, another word in this field, which is activism, also. But I, um, yesterday when I, I read Valkyria's uh, concept, definition of uh, agency, 
um, came to my mind also the notion of performativity, which is uh, very similar, I think. And uh, you know, that was stressed by uh, Paulo today. Uh, at the beginning, he mentioned that it's not enough to, to do, but we also have to say it. Uh, but uh, for me, I think, broadly speaking, it seems that um, agency uh, is, has a, a higher degree of consciousness, of awareness, than performativity does. Um, anyway, especially when it takes into account Paulo Freire's uh, notion of conscientização. And maybe activism would be uh, one step further. Okay, uh, Roberto, and then um, Valkyria wants some time to respond, and then we'll have our break. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I was uh, thinking here uh, about that relationship between the schools and the streets, the way uh, Ian mentioned the, the protest, and then Mario was talking about how uh, each place has its own uh, possibilities of, of uh, agency. Uh, and, and, and then uh, just uh, to mention that right now uh, uh, thousands of, of, of teachers are in the streets in, in Rio de Janeiro, for example, and all over Brazil. And they are the same teachers that uh, Valkyria was talking about in her papers. And, and, and the, but the question is not of having or not having agency, as in my put it, puts it, but of what kind of agency. So I, I was uh, uh, wondering if, it would, if we could think of that, uh, let's say, passive uh, 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 performance in, in, in classrooms as uh, uh, a kind of agency in, in, in the teaching profession, as a kind of uh, 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 way of uh, exerting uh, the possible uh, uh, agency uh, in face of uh, uh, the uh, in face of the paralysis that uh, uh, the school system uh, uh, somehow imposes or produces uh, uh, in face of the paralysis that theory, and then thinking of the term uh, broadly, somehow uh, uh, has produced or, or, or produces. Well, the thing is, I, I, I think that the, the classroom uh, is a possibility because the constraints of the uh, uh, limitations and censorships of, of the school system and, or, or the school uh, 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 structure, what is in place at school, uh, in, inside the classroom, in, in the teacher, in the relation, uh, teacher-student relationship, that those constraints are loosened. And I think then that the, the, the role of methodology and, and, and uh, the work, uh, I think that the, at least my interest and my focus is on what happens inside or in between uh, 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 those relations. And, and I think that's a space where a, a, a change in agency could occur. use my position just to say one thing quickly to throw out a question because I'm I'm interested in the gendered dynamics of all of this and and whether there is a gender dynamics in uh, Brazil for example the vocation element uh, the majority of elementary school teachers in Canada are women and there's always been a sense that women have this nurturing vocation and therefore they don't need to be paid for the work they do and so I just want to throw that into the equation around agency uh, for discussion perhaps during the break because Valkyria well, needs some time to respond to what we've heard so far. Well, that's interesting. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for more, more uh, food for thought. It's uh, uh, in relation to what you say, I think I'd like to tell the other ones, I mean, the ones that do not uh, know that uh, a certain politician in Brazil once has said, you already know, Alan Mario, uh, once he has said that in Brazil, teachers are not uh, underpaid. There are no underpaid teachers. There are, there are no underpaid teachers. The, the fact is that they have, uh, they have uh, married the wrong husband, you know? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 that's right. You see, this is, this is, you, this may explain a bit why I talk about professionalism when I refer to teacher education, right? Because at a certain, at a certain extent, I think that many other politicians and many other people would agree with this idea of vocation, right? That uh, 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 the perfect profession for a woman would be becoming for a woman, and and nowadays we've been having more male teachers, but uh, uh, the majority in Brazil used to be only female. I mean, majority would be female. Uh, saying that 
uh, that is the right profession for a woman because then they go they go to school, they teach and go back home to take care of the kids and to do the to wash the dish and you know to well to do the the, 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 the to take care of the household, right? So this is uh, something interesting, you know. Just I don't know if you've had any similar situation in your country, but we have this one here, right? And uh, it's a politician that has great representation. I would say many people would vote for him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to say something? Yeah, let Neil respond to that. Just on that point, you ask uh, whether we have a similar situation. So just so that you know, uh, in Canada, first of all, there is a singular lack of male teachers, number one. Uh, and there is all kinds of research about the learning of boys and girls and the, the differentiation between those. a big, big field of scholarship. So uh, it... Cognitive. Uh, sorry? Cognitive. Yes, yes. So. Uh, yes, uh, so this is, this is the reason why I've been talking about denaturalizing some of the views that people have on the profession, some of the views that people have on uh, the role of students and teachers, and this hierarchy that is so much, you know, uh, given, uh, that is given so much importance, right, in, in this area. Uh, well, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, uh, this lack of professionalism is something to be worked on, I think, here, right? So, uh, uh, my, my idea is, uh, I think that we've inherited, I, 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 of course, that I, I play a bit with these, uh, these concepts that we have in here, saying that we all teachers have a certain missionary inhabit, inhabiting our souls. This is something that I joke with teachers, right? Because they always think that uh, they, they, they should suffer a bit, you know, but they, they, they don't have to be well paid, okay? Because it's part of their, of their profession, you see? Those that, that have opted for that are, feel okay with this idea. Many of them, I tell you, many of them. However, through its so not it's the mother's lot. Yeah, it is. It is. Sorry. And uh, just wrap up, maybe. Yeah. To break. Yeah. Okay. So just uh, just to say that um, I just I was following a flow, okay, of ideas. So this this idea that if actually teachers have agency, I don't mean that they don't have agency. What I try to do is to promote the agency they have and to to make them feel more you know, comfortable, that they can do things as well. Not only receive, you know, uh, information or ready solutions for their classes. Because the ethnographic research shows us that when they close the doors, they don't necessarily do what they are taught to do. See? However, they hide this. They never tell publicly. When they go to, let's say, congresses, they never say, what they really do when they close the doors of their rooms, see? And I would like them to feel more incentivated to say, no, I do not agree with this, and this is the reason why I do different things many times, you see? Or this doesn't work with my students and I can do differently. If I know more options also, if I, 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 we, I can discuss different options of what, sh what could be done with the students as well, right? So this is something that I call agency as well, you see, because there is a, a certain hypocrisy in education when people believe that everything works fine, okay? Uh, as, as I was uh, mentioning, just to finish, I, as I was mentioning yesterday, the military here in Brazil, there is a very famous sentence of a military president that we had in the past when he said, I love TV news in Brazil. The world is in chaos, but Brazil is working fine, you know? And uh, this, is, this explains a bit to me some situations of uh, politicians and, uh, and uh, those in the government that believe that education is, is going fine, is doing fine, and teachers as well, you see. When uh, then in the manifestations of the streets, people say, this is not what we want, we want something different, okay? Just to finish it, thank you very much.